I'm Blake Wilson. I'm the sugarcane entomologist with the LSU Ag Center, and I'll be presenting today as kind of a tag team approach with Dr. Hannah Penn of the USDA Sugar Research Unit in HOMA. So I'll cover some of the uh, great success we've had in developing a sugarcane board IPM program and how that's changed uh, the sugarcane industry. And then I'll turn it over to Hannah to talk about how we'll have to try to adjust that program to also uh, successfully manage the emerging pest the Mexican rice borer. So our two pests that are the main threats to sugarcane in Louisiana are both stem borers. Uh, they have similar feeding behaviors, um, but they're uh, different in a few ways. The long established pest, the sugarcane borer here on the left, has been the key pest in Louisiana for more than a century and was really the only major economic pest that required uh, consistent management throughout the industry for most of that time. There really isn't enough, a whole spectrum of pests like we see in other crops that are consistently damaging. Uh, the sugarcane borer has been the primary threat for most of the time we've been producing sugarcane in Louisiana. On the other hand, the emerging pest is the Mexican rice borer. Uh, this insect has been advancing eastward into the state, really just started infesting significant acreage in Louisiana in the past few years, but it, it's a very damaging pest of sugarcane in South Texas, and certainly is emerging as a very uh, real threat to sugarcane production here in Louisiana as well. Over the years, we've had a lot of major advances in how we were managing sugarcane borer. Uh, like most commodities, after the emergence of chemical insecticides in the 50s and 60s, those pesticides really became the uh, center of pest management strategies. But in the following decades, we were able to reduce reliance on that and get uh, towards a more integrated approach, starting with the uh, introduction of economic thresholds and reduced spraying on a schedule in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Further in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, we really adopted widespread scouting programs and we had our first uh, selective chemistries that are less damaging to beneficial insects. And that allowed us to conserve some natural enemies, particularly fire ants and parasitoid wasps that really help regulate sugarcane borer populations in the absence of insecticides. And in the modern era, uh, in the past 10 years or so, we've even further reduced the number of insecticide applications going out. Uh, the newest group of insecticides are the diamides. They're very effective, our most effective chemistries we've had available to us over this time. And we've also got several uh, resistant varieties, bull resistant varieties, particularly uh, 299 is the predominant cane in Louisiana, and it shows a, a high level of resistance and so together, we've been able to incorporate a number of different management tactics over the past 60 years to reduce our reliance on insecticides. And that's really had a lasting effect. Uh, here, this is our spring populations of sugarcane borer. This is a dead heart survey data over the past 17 years. And these are rolling averages, so it kind of smooths out some of the fluctuations, but you can see uh, a very consistent decline uh, in those numbers over the past 17 years. And these are area-wide populations over the whole industry in the spring. And this translates into a, a, a better economic measure, which is the percentage of acreage treated. We used to be treating uh, about 60% of the acreage at least once. That number has declined in the past five years or so. We've only been treating about a third of the acreage. Um, and this data comes from chemical sales records I got for our two primary uh, insecticides used in the sugarcane industry, Confirm and Prevathon. So I think it's, it's fairly accurate in terms of what's going out. And uh, I think most farmers and consultants will agree the 
number of applications and the amount of fields they're spraying over the past 20 years has declined substantially. So I think this uh, resulted from a number of major changes, particularly one that I don't think gets a lot of attention is the introduction of the combine harvester. This allowed for a cleaner harvest, less large stock pieces left in the field, and that reduces sugarcane borer overwintering populations, which I think may be contributing to that dramatic decline we saw in the spring dead hearts. Uh, another thing is those more effective insecticides, particularly Prevathon, has a very long residual, uh, up to eight weeks in many cases. And so that's prevented the need for multiple applications to the same field within one year. And the emergence of some new resistant varieties. Uh, 384 was very highly susceptible, required aggressive for management. Even some of the varieties we consider more susceptible now, such as 540, are significantly uh, more resistant than 384. And we've got a lot of other resistant varieties on significant acreage, 299, 838, even 283 has some resistance. So these are three really key factors, I think, that have contributed to the reduced need for insecticides. Another thing is uh, we've got great consultants in the industry. Almost every acre of sugarcane in Louisiana is scouted by independent crop consultants. And these people are responsible for managing the sugarcane board. That's one of their primary duties. And the biggest decision they make is initiating those economic thresholds, making sure they get insecticides applied before boars can enter the stalks and before we have widespread injury. And so we know that we're spraying less and the IPM program appears to have been effective, but there isn't a lot of assessment of how well this program is being implemented. Uh, I don't think a lot of farmers are checking what levels of injury is present in those fields at, at the time of harvest. And so that was one of my aims. I started a project three years ago. And what we did uh, was work with the sugarcane mills. I'm not sure if there's any of my mill cooperators on the call, but they were very uh, essential to this effort. Collected uh, sugarcane billet sacks, which were designed to represent independent fields. So each one of these sacks uh, was a separate field from an area. We had five mills uh, geographically covering the biggest part of the sugarcane belt we could. And we hand inspected all these for sugarcane bore injury uh, over three years. And here's a quick snapshot of that data. Uh, what we saw was overall the average percentage board internodes was very low. Uh, over the three years, it's just under 1%. We also looked at the percentage of samples above 3% board. This is the what we call the economic injury level or the target to stay below. So if taken again over the three-year average, in more than 90% of the sugarcane fields in the wheel, in Louisiana, I think there's little to no room for improvement in how we're managing the sugarcane board. We did find some, uh, some kind of extreme examples where I would consider these control failures where we had very high levels of injury. Uh, however, these were certainly the vast minority most of the samples were very clean as is reflected by the overall averages. So really this data collectively shows uh, IPM for the sugarcane bore is being very effectively implemented uh, across the industry. Uh, I wanted to take that a step further and do an economic impact analysis and see how much this pest is really impacting the industry. And the numbers are, are pretty encouraging. Based on the average of about 1% board, we're not losing much, about $8 an acre in terms of direct losses in, in sugar production. With those revised numbers about treating only a third of the acreage, that's representing a low input cost of just about $7 an acre. And you put those numbers together and you get somewhere from five to 10 million total in a given year of uh, economic impact from the sugarcane board. Now that's a, a multi-million dollar impact is nothing to dismiss, 
But I think when you consider the context and the value of the industry, it's it's really a good situation. Um, so this has been a real successful program. Not only do we have a diverse and integrative uh, integrated approach that has reduced reliance on insecticides, but it's also being implemented very well by our consultants and farmers across the state. And compared to other crops, I think we're in a very favorable situation based on the kind of uh, gross estimate that the sugar uh, crop value for sugarcane is over a billion dollars annually. That puts the impact of the sugarcane bore at less than 1% of the annual crop value considering losses and uh, total input costs. To put that in perspective, the global average across all commodities for losses to insects is estimated to be 14%. And this number doesn't even include input costs. So relative to other commodities and other production systems, I think uh, the pest management situation in, in Louisiana is currently very favorable. However, uh, that's going to have to be adapted some, as I mentioned with the emergence of a, a new threat, the Mexican rice borer. And so I'll turn it over to Hannah to talk about some of the challenges and some of the ways we think we can maintain the success moving forward. Thank you, Blake. Um, so I guess first off, uh, this is a map of the Mexican rice for range expansion in Louisiana. Um, so it's originally from South Texas, like Blake said. Um, and you can see that most of the Western regions of sugarcane production in Louisiana um, already have Mexican rice borer present. Um, and we've had some movement and we anticipate that the river parishes uh, will see Mexican rice borer moving in in the next few years. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, thank you. Um, so some of this previous work done by uh, Dr. Wilson, we can see that chemical control, especially with Prevathon, can be very effective against Mexican rice borer. So this actually was in uh, South Texas um, a few years ago, but you can see that the chemistries that we currently have for sugar cane borer can be pretty effective on Mexican rice borer as well. Um, so much so that Texas hasn't really been spraying for Mexican rice borer, and now that these new chemistries are on the market, um, they've actually been looking into controlling it uh, via these chemical sprays more so than they had been. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so when you look at a mix of infestation, so in the western part of Louisiana where we have both the sugarcane borer and the Mexican rice borer, um, so you have the Mexican rice borer here in gray, the sugarcane borer in yellow, and then both borers in white. Um, you can still see that Prevathon, again, is performing very well for both pests at the same time. Um, although I will note that in these areas, especially where rice is grown, Prevathon is also used as a seed treatment. So we need to be on the lookout for some potential resistance to that product. Um, but again, we can get some pretty good control for both of these pests at the same time. Um, and then going back to that IPM um, issue, when we look at these resistant varieties, so this is in Beaumont, Texas, uh, we can see that some of the same varieties that are resistant to the sugarcane borer are also effective against the Mexican rice borer. Um, so we have a good amount of overlap there in terms of what kind of protection we have for these borers. Um, and then looking at data we collected actually just this last week um, from Rio Farms. Next slide, please. Um, we can see that a combination of these varieties and treating with Prevathon can be pretty effective. So this red dotted line indicates the treated uh, baseline levels for these different varieties of sugarcane. Um, and then for the sugarcane that's not treated, you can see that we have a really large percent increase in the number of Mexican rice borer damage to these different varieties. So some varieties get hit a little bit harder than others. So if you don't use resistant varieties, uh, then treatment with Prevathon or another chemistry is very recommended. Um, next slide. Um, and this is because when it comes down to your production, this sugar per acre, 
uh, we can see that there's both a variety and a treatment influence on how much sugar per acre you're going to be getting. Um, and the difference between the treated and the untreated does depend on that variety, but overall the treatment does matter. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, here, the, the treated values are that baseline red dotted line, and then the untreated cane is below that. So when we ran the statistics on uh, this trial that we had this year, um, we saw that if you treat it and you have different varieties, uh, you lose some of your sugar production if you don't treat your cane. So again, uh, these IPM methods that we've been using for sugar cane borer using um, soft chemistries like Prevathon, and then looking at these resistant sugarcane varieties, both of these are very effective against the Mexican rice borer in the valley. And so we hope that we can apply that here in Louisiana. Um, and so some of the new tools that we can track Mexican rice borer, um, so this is something that we don't currently have for the sugarcane borer, but we have pheromone traps. Um, and so this is something that can assist in actually pinpointing which fields need to be scouted more often. Um, so there isn't a precise number of insects in the trap, that means you should spray, but it does indicate that if you have a lot of Mexican rice borers coming in, you really need to keep your eyes open uh, for what you need to do in terms of treatment. Um, so next slide. Uh, we do have some, some future work to be done for Mexican rice borers. So again, kind of getting, you know, the scouting and the treatment threshold, especially with the trap data in the different varieties, uh, kind of in line with the economic value that those things provide. Uh, we need to be doing that. Again, insecticide resistance could become an issue, especially because the same active ingredients that we use for these borers are used in rice in the same areas. Um, we also know that the efficacy of predators and parasitoids is lower for Mexican rice borers than it is for the sugarcane borer. And this is because the Mexican rice borer packs its hole uh, full of frass. And so the, the ants and the parasitoids can't really get in there as effectively as they can with the sugarcane borer, which means that we actually have a smaller window of opportunity to, to really get at this thing before it uh, bores into the cane and can't be treated anymore. Um, and we also have some opposite outbreak conditions. So when you think about the environmental conditions and what that means for your borer issues, um, you're, you're kind of, you know, out of luck either way in terms of if you have a, a wet spring, you're going to have sugarcane borer issues. And if you have a dry spring, you're going to have Mexican rice borer issues. So either way, you need to be looking out for, for what's going to be on the horizon. It just depends on which of the insects you're actually going to be dealing with. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all of our collaborators, um, all the Texas data we've gotten from Rio Farms, um, and then all the students and technicians and funding that made this possible, and uh, we will take any questions. Okay, I have one question that came in from Everton Barreto with uh, U.S. Sugar. From your point of view, how does Louisiana sugarcane, the Louisiana sugarcane industry, see the development of new varieties with BT technology to control this issue? That's a very interesting question. We've we've looked at the BT corn uh, varieties against both of these pests, and it's <clears throat> highly effective. Uh, but I, I think once you start with biotechnology and and how that's licensed and things that can be a whole can of worms. So in terms of managing the pests, I think BT would be very effective and reduce the need for scouting almost entirely. Uh, but it's my understanding that the Louisiana industry isn't particularly interested in, in going towards GMO varieties. Um, somebody else may be able to shed some more light on that too. Uh, this is Collins. Um, you know, with the BT technology, um, the marketing might be a problem, but from a breeding standpoint, we have a problem also with ripeners because of the BT gene. Okay, I have a question from Dr. Ken Gravois with the LSU Ag Center. He asks, what are plant characteristics that will drive resistance to the Mexican rice borer? Uh, thanks, Kenneth. There, a lot of the same characteristics that give resistance to the sugarcane borer, I think, are going to be a factor. Those are things like a rind hardness and tightness of leaf sheaths. 
Uh, also, some of the ones that we try to get away from, like high fiber content, uh, that can be detrimental to milling. But the big one that we've shown that's different from sugarcane bore is the curl and senescing of leaf sheets. The Mexican rice bore moths really prefer to lay their eggs on dry leaf material. So there's been some work uh, showing that less senescent leaves or even shedding of those senescent leaves so that they're on the ground uh, may be a, a unique source of resistance to Mexican rice borer that is a bit different from sugarcane borer. I have another question from uh, Gene Adolph in Assumption Parish. Any major timing issues with the application of pesticides or are they basically the same, catching them early when on the leaves? Yeah, they're basically the same. Uh, I think with two pests present, it's gonna require more frequent scouting, a little closer eye uh, by some of the scouts and consultants. But in general, you try to time the insecticides while the larvae are feeding in the leaf sheet. Uh, we do have some results that indicate that window between when they hatch out and when they enter the stalk may be a bit shorter for Mexican rice borer. Uh, so there may require some increased frequency of scouting, but in general, timing is gonna be about the same uh, uh, seasonally as well. So I think it's gonna be most important to start scouting when you have fully developed internodes and you can probably stop scouting uh, once you get out of the month of August and, and ripeners have started going out and things like that. Okay, uh, Anna Hale would like to comment a little bit about BT. Sure. Hey, Colin, don't they have to with BT each time you have a new variety developed, you have to go through another round of paperwork with with BT in particular? Yes, probably. It's a probably. nightmare? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I was just wondering. Yes, because, I mean, when I was in Rice, you could you could go transform a variety that was easy to um, transform uh, a lab rat is what we called it. You could easily back cross that. In sugarcane, you can't really back cross these genes, so each each variety would be a separate uh, transformation event, a separate approval from EPA, FDA. So, you know, we're, we're a little bit more complicated. Uh, uh, Collins and group, uh, Avery, this is Jim Simo. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yeah, uh, so yeah, just to comment on, on the BT stuff, uh, you know, as an industry, uh, with regards to the Florida question, you know, we work very closely with, with those folks and everything that we try to do. And, uh, and I would say that there's, there's not, uh, as, as some may have said, that there's, there's not a, a, an unwillingness of our industry to embrace BT technology or any kind of Roundup Ready technology or any of those kinds of things. It's just a matter of, of, uh, of the cost uh, associated with those activities. And, you know, in Louisiana, when we're planting maybe uh, 60, 70,000 acres of cane a year, uh, we, we find it really, really difficult to get any of the BT type companies in, interested in, uh, in, in going through all of the, the expense, the years of, of work associated with trying to develop uh, uh, a modified, uh, genetically modified uh, cane variety. So it's it's not at all that we're not interested as as an organization and as researchers uh, that work for the industry. You know, we're always looking for every possible advantage, uh, but you do have to weigh the cost of, of those activities. And and so uh, uh, we're certainly interested in, in advancing technologies, but BT and Roundup Ready or GMO stuff is. We just haven't found the, the commercial cooperators that have interest uh, like our, our brethren in the beet industry have been fortunate to get. I see Herman Wagaspak has his hand raised. Uh, Herman, if you could unmute and uh, ask your question, please. Yeah, Avery, uh, thank you. Um, Jim, uh, 
jumped in and, and said pretty much what I was going to say. I, I had raised my hand, but um, look, we, uh, we have talked about it and uh, it's not to say that we're not interested. Um, CRISPR Cas9 gene editing may be uh, an avenue that we would be able to uh, work on. And, um, but anyway, those discussions are being had and I assure you if there's an opportunity that we will, um, that we can see it would benefit the industry, we'll, uh, we'll fully explore it. Okay, any other questions for uh, Blake or Hannah? Thank you.